I'm going to give the floor first, as I said, to my colleague, the, the ambassador of Portugal in Ottawa. Thank Please. you. Uh, Senhor Presidente do Instituto Diplomático, Ambassador Freitas Ferraz, uh, our host, of course, our guest of honor, Professor Gilberto Fernandes, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Heaton, the Chargé d'Affaires of Canada to Portugal, dear guests and participants, my warmest salute in this occasion to all of you. Let me start by conveying to our uh, Canadian representatives our heartfelt condolences on the passing away of uh, the former uh, the former sovereign, the late Queen Elizabeth II. It's a privilege and a great honor as well to participate today as Portuguese ambassador to this great and beautiful country, Canada, in this webinar celebrating the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between uh, both countries, the two countries. Canada and Portugal are allies. We all know too well that NATO bounds us together since it started in 1949. So formally, we are allies in the framework of the Atlantic Alliance. There's no need to underline how much the current war of aggression in Ukraine uh, has get us closer, not only from the bilateral point of view, of course, but also as uh, uh, in the framework of Canada and the EU uh, relation, uh, relationship. The Russia war provoked a food and energy crisis and the rela related effects on, of inflation that both countries share, affecting uh, mainly the most vulnerable in our societies. Anyhow, our bilateral ties, something we must acknowledge in due course, from my point of view, set up an overall and encompassing informal alliance of a kind. That's the one forged by kinship uh, bonds. It started historically a long time ago, either before or after other people, on the 16th century and afterwards, with Portuguese fishermen who came to the Atlantic coast to make a living. Since and after and closer to our time, the Portuguese immigration to Canada shaped the relationship marking the strongest bilateral link imagined in each other, of course. As of this day, the presence of in this, country, in this country, Canada, of almost half a million Portu people of Portuguese origin who are uh, uh, Canadian citizens who decided to establish themselves here, are the most powerful alliance in my point of view. Let me recall the Prime Minister's bilateral statement on enhanced cooperation issued in 2018 and signed by His Excellencies Justin Trudeau and Antonio Costa at the time of the latest official visit to Canada. But this is not the only part. The core of our bilateral relations spreads from political and diplomatic formal links encompassed in our consultations processes, paying visits to each other, high-level meetings, our shared common international goals, our vision of the world and the way international relations should be based, and so on. It, it, it can be found there that we both share the forefront of fighting on fighting climate change, promoting gender equality, developing a, a multilateral way of living, protecting and integrating migrants. Sharing shores in the Atlantic Ocean, we both believe in lib liberal democracy as the best possible way of living all over the world in respecting and defending human rights, in re redeeming our oceans, all oceans from a, from a somber uh, destiny. We are allies all, in all those ways, not only formally within NATO. It was a long way from the start. It's an even brightest perspective to expect. I'm looking forward to listening very attentively and with much interest to what Professor Gilberto Fernandes will tell us today and learn much more on the role of diplomacy in setting up the Portuguese diaspora in Canada and doing it originated the most solid common ground in our partnership and alliance informal. Portuguese Canadians in all strides of life are responsible for a unique contribution to our relationship. While evoking each one, let me finish to personalize the two MPs who, as Canadian members of federal parliament with Portuguese origin, 
through their work and endeavors in this country, prestige the world community of origin, Portugal, and this embassy as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And now I'll give the floor to Mr. Jeffrey Hitton, please. Thank you, Ambassador Freitas Ferraz, uh, for thank the introduction, and, and thank you to Ambassador uh, Leo Rocha for that excellent overview of our historical relationship and also our uh, dynamic, multifaceted cooperation that's evolved into today. Um, I'm very delighted to be participating in today's event on behalf of the Embassy of Canada to Portugal. And I first wanted to recognize the initiative of Ambassador Freitas Ferraz and the Diplomatic Institute in organizing today's event, which is part of our ongoing joint celebrations of this year's 70th anniversary of Canada-Portugal diplomatic relations. So thank, thank you very much. Um, as part of these celebrations, we've been very pleased to be collaborating with the Diplomatic Institute, as well as the Portuguese Embassy to Canada and other partners to help commemorate our shared history, as well as to celebrate and highlight the depth and dynamism of our current relationship as Ambassador uh, Leo Rocha was explaining. Um, the Embassy was pleased to attend an earlier initiative of the Diplomatic Institute here in Lisbon, showcasing historical diplomatic documents from the Portuguese archives, uh, which we complemented on the Canadian side with an online display of several similar documents from our national archives. Uh, certainly some very interesting things uh, on display. We've also been very proud to sponsor several of our own initiatives here in Portugal in honour of this 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations, and I wanted to highlight just two of those. Uh, the first was a photo exhibition that we inaugurated in Ribera Grande in the Azores on Portugal Day in June, and this documented the history of Azorean emigration to Canada. Uh, as, as many of you will know, a large proportion of the Portuguese diaspora in Canada has roots in the Azores, and we were very pleased to be able to partner with the Associação dos Migrantes Azorianos to celebrate and showcase this shared history. Uh, the second anniversary event of note was the organization of our first ever Canadian film festival, uh, showcasing Canada's diversity and values to audiences in, in Lisbon, Porto and, and in Punta Delgada. And among, among special guests at, at that uh, film festival was a luso Quebecois actor named Gabriel Dalmeida Freitas, who was the star of one of the films, and he attended the screening in, in the Azores along with members of his Azorean extended family. So in a sense, he was personifying the, the evolution of our bilateral relationship, which has expanded in new directions from its uh, traditional origins, but is always anchored in our strong diaspora and people-to-people -people ties. Uh, so in closing, let's just allow me to, to thank Professor Gilberto Fernandes for, for your contributions to our, our shared journey between our two countries through your scholarship and as well as for your engagement in events such as today's. Uh, we're very grateful to you as well as to many others in attendance today from the Portuguese community in Canada as well as the Canadian community here in Portugal. Uh, for your efforts to, mo to promote our bilateral friendship and to create new collaborations and opportunities for the future. So thank you. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you so much. Please, Professor Gilberto Fernandes, you have the floor. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to all for your, your kind words uh, of welcome. Um, greetings from Toronto and from my uh, home office, where I, I hope the internet will uh, stay as is throughout. Uh, if it does go down, I'll just ask for you to bear uh, with me for a moment as I reconnect using my cell phone. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen. So let me just try to figure this out for a moment. I have some slides. I believe you can see that um i can't uh, so now i can't see uh, anyone so uh i'll just have a, an audio confirmation that you can see it someone confirm they can see my slides yes yes yes, yes wonderful thank you okay yes, so um thank you again uh, to the instituto diplomatico and uh, everyone involved in organizing this event uh, for inviting me to share my research with you as part of this milestone anniversary uh, it's a real honor uh, to present to such a distinguished audience uh, and institution my presentation will be in english mas se me quiserem colocar questões em português um, no final da apresentação terei todo o gosto em responder da mesma forma my talk today draws from the research that I started during my doctoral studies at York University in Toronto, where I'm currently a visiting professor, uh, 
which later led to my book, This Pilgrim Nation. In that book, I discussed the transnational history of Portuguese communities in, in Canada and the United States, and the role played by the Estado Novo dictatorship in the creation of a diasporic consciousness and institutions against the backdrop of the Cold War, the American Civil Rights Movement, the Portuguese colonial wars, and Canadian multiculturalism. While not solely about the Portuguese Foreign Service, the work of the regime's diplomats in North America uh, between the 50s and 70s is a big part of the study, and uh, it's the part that I will discuss in my talk today. I should also say that most of my archival research for this book was done at the Archivo Histórico Diplomatico of the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Lisbon. And so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank, uh, to acknowledge and express my gratitude for the help of the archive staff, um, the help that they granted me uh, during my visits. A pilgrim nation of patriotic missionaries, worldly citizens, and pluri pluricontinental communities that included metropolitan residents, colonial settlers, and immigrants in every corner of the world. That was a vision laid out by the Estado Novo's former overseas minister, Adriano Moreira, in 1964, at a meeting in Aveiro that gathered the country's intelligentsia to discuss the beleaguered state of the empire. The need to reclaim expatriates as full citizens of the imperial nation was understood then to be not simply a sentimental matter, but a shrewd recognition that their communities were st strategic outposts for advancing Portugal's foreign interests during a time of great anti-colonialist international pressure. Fast forward to the fall of the dictatorship in the colonial empire with the Carnation's revolution in 1974, Diaspor, uh, diasporic visions now gripped the minds of Portuguese government officials like never before. In his National Day Holiday speech in 1977, President Ramalho Yenj officially proclaimed the dawn of a new diasporic nationhood. In his words, and I quote, decolonization, far from meaning that Portugal has lost its ecumenical perspective, has reclaimed its historical vocation in a purer state. The country that we are today does not look at men as instruments, instruments of territorial exploration, but instead considers them links of an indestructible community of sentiment and culture. Thus, a new concept of fatherland emerges from our authentic national tradition. It matters more the man than the ground where he lives on." End quote. By replacing imperial with diasporic mythologies, the Portuguese intelligentsia found a solution for the crisis of national identity in which the country had fallen with the end of the centuries old empire. This repositioning allowed the Lisbon government to cling to the old pluricontinental idea of nationhood and maintain, maintain some of its former geopolitical relevance beyond the small corner in Europe's periphery, which it refused to be restricted to. Once mocked by Portuguese elites, immigrants were now elevated to heroic status as the flag bearers of the nation's borderless, entrepreneurial and cosmopolitan spirit often compared to the explorers of Portugal's golden age of seafaring history. They were encouraged to think of themselves as transnational citizens living in a diaspora that the homeland government vowed to nourish and facilitate. Most immigrants welcomed this institutional outreach and saw it as a positive step towards redressing the supposed negligence that they had been subjected to during the dictatorship and as due recognition for their ongoing contributions to their homeland. Still, this diaspora building project stood on a foundation that was previously laid by the imperial dictatorships, diplomatic corps, and other international minded sectors of the regime, and, and was in large part built on recycled discourses and methods. Diplomats have been part of this history from the very start of the Portuguese mass migration to Canada. It was largely thanks to the insistence of the Canadian consul in Lisbon, Lester Glass, that the two governments agreed to a labor migration agreement that started with a small pilot group of skilled male workers in 1952. When this official movement ended in 1961, over 6,800 male workers had been requested. The vast majority was des were destined for unskilled occupations in farms, railway track building, logging, and other toiling jobs shunned by Canadians. A significant minority of these supposed low-skilled workers were in, fact, were in fact tradesmen and small business owners who pretended to be common laborers in order to meet the selection criteria of migration officials. Together with the 800 skilled workers recruited during this agreement and others sponsored by their kin, these relatively higher educated migrants would assume leadership positions 
in the Portuguese communities that emerged in Toronto, Montreal, and other smaller settlements across Canada. Before settling in the cities, many of these migrant workers had a common experience of isolation, exploitation, and hardship in the Canadian hinterland, resulting in large part from the lack of English or French language skills, but also from the prejudicial views about Southern European immigrants held by many of their employers. Migrant farmhands especially, made several complaints to Portuguese officials about their living and working conditions. The consuls try to appease these migrants by occasionally visiting them, shifting them between farms and speaking to their employers, ultimately trying to manage Canadian perceptions about the quality of Portuguese workers. As was common among other nationalities, the number of Portuguese migrant workers breaking their one-year one year contracts to look for better jobs elsewhere was high. Despite the efforts of government officials on both sides, the number of contract skippers increased exponentially with each new migrant cohort arriving in Canada every year. Ottawa tolerated this high absconding rate of migrant farmhands since they filled important labor shortages in the cities. This only became a problem when it coincided with periods of high unemployment. Reacting to one such period and to the rise of anti-Southern European sentiment among Anglo-Canadians, Ottawa decided to end this migration agreement in 1961 and moved to limit the entrance of unskilled migrants into Canada. By that point, a critical mass of Portuguese immigrants had already settled in Canada and was able to sustain a large migration chain autonomously from international schemes. The end of the labor migration agreement coincided with the outbreak of the colonial wars in Africa, which introduced a major incentive for military-aged men and families with young boys to leave Portugal in order to escape the mandatory military draft. Changes in the Canadian immigration system in 1967 that privileged highly skilled applicants raised a significant barrier to Portuguese mass migration, which owed its existence to Canada's high demand for low-skilled workers. Still, their numbers continued to grow, not only via family sponsorship, but also through extensive clandestine channels that developed alongside the official channels. One common way for undocumented migrants to settle in Canada was to pass as tourists, overstay their visas, and later apply for landed status. They often did this with the help of illegal migration rackets run by travel agents. And in one case, in 1957, the Portuguese, consul uh, Portuguese consular staff in Montreal were implicated in one such racket, which resulted in many immigrant hopefuls in the Azores being defrauded at significant sums of money. Most immigrant families were able to improve their economic situation after some time in Canada, thanks to a great deal of sacrifice and hard work. But their relative economic success often came at heavy cost, heavy cost to their mental and physical health and led to severe strains on the family structure. Seasonal unemployment, workplace injuries and fatalities in dangerous jobs, domestic violence, high rates of school dropout, and youth criminality were some of the most common social problems encountered in Portuguese households in the cities. Eager to address these problems, was an army of Canadian social workers and settlement agencies, most of them associated with Protestant churches. But before the immigrants started using the settlement services of Canadian organizations, their first access to social aid in Canada came from the consulates. For instance, in the mid 1950s, the vice consul in Montreal, Father Manuel Almeida, took multiple tri trips to meet isolated migrant farmhands across Quebec, who requested his help in resolving disputes with employers connecting with fellow countrymen, finding employment, or simply uplifting their spirits. Father Almeida gave close to 3,000 Canadian dollars out of his own pocket to help these men. In 1955, his successor, Consul Vital Gomes, alerted Lisbon to the overwhelming number of aid requests received from immigrants across the province and how his office had helped them find employment and obtain free medical assistance. assistance. Regrettably, Gomes had not been able to satisfy requests for money or avail them of the most basic food, clothing, and housing needs, given that consular regulations only allow these in cases of repatriation. The consular staff also assisted newcomers at Montreal's airport on a regular basis without additional pay, sometimes late into the night. Concern about the well-being of these early migrant workers, many of whom sent most of their earnings to their families back home and placed themselves in difficult financial situations in Canada. The, ministry of Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs paid uh, about $100 uh, monthly into an emergency aid fund to be dispersed by the consulates 
to immigrants in distress. Fearing the denationalization of its immigrant flock through assimilation into Protestant or Irish or French Catholic denominations, Portuguese government and ecclesiastical authorities saw the need to send missionaries to Canada. Diplomats understood the importance of having Portuguese priests in these budding communities, not only for the social and spiritual aid they provided, but because priests were able to intervene directly in the community's organizational life in ways that diplomats could not or should not. They could, however, control the priests and intervene indirectly in community affairs through them, or so they thought. The lack of missionaries willing to move to Canada complicated things. Their shortest empower those few missionaries who did settle in Toronto, Montreal, where they were responsible for large congregations in highly concentrated, concentrated neighborhoods. These missionaries founded social service centers, schools, and newspapers, acted as translators, marriage and youth counselors, employment agents, in addition to directing their parishes and running the many religious feasts. With all this activity, they became some of the most influential leaders during the community's formative years, especially among the Azorian majority, whose organizational activity was centered around uh, the parish and its religious festivals, in part because they were shunned by the mainlander minority that controlled the secular organizations and sometimes discriminated against Azorians. Rogue missionaries were common during the 50s and 60s, although their political views usually aligned with the dictatorship of which most were staunch defenders, some of these priests became nuisances for Portuguese diplomats, particularly when their personal ambitions interfered with the diplomats' plans or clashed with allied secular leaders. The most infamous of Portuguese priests in Canada was Father Alberto Cunha of Toronto St. Mary Catholic Church. Originally from Braga, Cunha had helped screen immigrant applicants during the labor migration movement in the 50s, during which he was invited by Canadian bishops to tend to the growing uh, Portuguese flock in Ontario. The Canadian Episcopate bypassed their Portuguese counterparts and went directly to Rome for permission. The Portuguese ambassador at the time, Eduardo de Brazil, was upset with this circumvention since it granted Cunha considerable autonomy from Portugal's ecclesiastic authorities and by extension, the dictatorship's control. Still, Brazil praised the services of Father Cunha and secured him a $200 uh, dollar monthly subvention from the Lisbon government. Over time, Portuguese diplomats grew concerned about Cunha's polemic personality, lack of ethics, alleged criminal activities, and hunger for power. They tried in vain to submit the rogue priest to their will by urging the Portuguese episcopacy to exert their authority over Cunha and send a strong-willed priest who could challenge his dominance. However, there was little they could do since Cunha was now under the jurisdiction of Toronto's archdiocese and was by then a Canadian citizen. Portuguese immigrants showed a remarkable capacity for civic engagement and organization, especially when considering their general lack of civic and organizational experience, having been raised under censorship, political surveillance, no freedom of assembly and association, and other restrictions that stifled civil society during the Estado Novo. Together with the many businesses that transformed their working class immigrant neighborhoods into vibrant commercial districts, they also launched multiple associations, sports clubs, newspapers, radio stations, social service agencies, schools, and other institutions. The dictatorship, which repressed civic and political engagement at home, encouraged it in the immigrant communities, in large part to increase their economic and political usefulness. Portuguese diplomats empowered amenable community leaders by giving them access to resources and political capital and boost, boosting their status as ethnic elites and representatives. The plan was to increase their influence with both the immigrant community and Canadian authorities and then leverage it to advance Portuguese, uh, Portugal's foreign interests in Canada. The other major factor prompting diplomats to intervene in the community's public life was the presence of small but well-organized and well-connected groups of political exiles and war resistors in Toronto and Montreal which were the most vocal and the most visible Portuguese organizations in Canada in the 50s and 70s. Integrated in the Portuguese anti-fascist opposition's external front, these activists were able to draw the attention of mainstream media multiple times, along with endorsements from many high-profile Canadians. One example of how homeland politics affected the internal dynamics of community organizations and how diplomats try to control them was the Associação Portuguesa do Canadá, or APC, which was the first Portuguese organization founded in Canada. 
in Montreal in January 1956. From the outset, the APC's executives clashed with the local consul, who wanted them to align themselves with the dictatorship, keep them involved in the association's affairs, and report on the political activities of its members. When they declined, the consul tried to discredit the APC as a, quote, communist haven, and demanded its closure. The APC's executive retaliated by denouncing the consul's participation in an illegal migration racket that had defrauded prospective immigrants in the, in the Azores, as previously mentioned, which resulted in the consul's removal. The new consul tried to mend relations with the APC and offered them a small subsidy, which led to further internal conflicts between the pro and anti Salazar factions. This prompted the APC's founding administration to resign. At this point, Enrique Tavares Bello, a former consulate worker, became the APC's new president. Bello was an outspoken critic of Salazar, which upset the organization's pro Salazar members, leading to yet another split and Bello's subsequent resignation. As I mentioned earlier, there was a sizable minority of political exiles, war resistors, and pro democratic immigrants of various political stripes in Canada. Most of them gathered at the Portuguese Canadian Democratic Association, or PCDA, in Toronto, and the Movimento Democrático Português, or MDP, in Montreal. They held multiple rallies and protests, published newsletters and newspapers, organized conferences, cultural programming, fundraisers, gave interviews to Canadian media, helped war resistors and other exiles find asylum, and shared resources and information across a network of Portuguese oppositionists around the world. Besides corresponding with major figures of the Portuguese opposition, including Humberto Delgado, Henrique Alvão, Fortan Pitera Santos, and others, these anti fascists also had extensive contacts with progressive organizations in Canada, which sought their support for various causes. Their first and most dramatic demonstration happened in January 1961, at the height of the hijacking of the cruise ship Santa Maria by Henrique Galvão and his Siberian freedom fighting pirates. This drama, uh, this drama at high seas drew a great deal of international media attention to the situation in Portugal and its African colonies. On January 29, an estimated 1,000 immigrants on opposite sides of the issue clashed in front of the Portuguese consulate on Bay Street in what the Toronto media described as a riot. The PCDA had organized a motorcade of 17 cars carrying signs and flags in support of Galvão, which honked their horns as they drove past the consulate. This was scheduled to coincide with the, with the arrival of a pro Salazar delegation organized by a group of priests delivering a petition to the Portuguese consul pledging their support for Salazar's government. When the motorcade came around the block a second time, a large number of pro Salazar supporters exited to the street and engulfed the cars, blocking their passage and proceeded to, ki to kick, scrape, rattle, and eventually flip one of these vehicles. This show of patriotic loyalty climaxed when the consul descended to the lobby, stood up on a chair, and waved to his supporters, who responded with loud cheers. After 10 minutes of mayhem, the police arrived and dispersed the crowd, arresting two pro Salazar supporters. The Portuguese government would later pay for their court expenses. After the Galfão saga, the Portuguese government put more resources into the diaspora communities in North America, and launched a large public diplomacy, lobbying, and propaganda campaign in an effort to shape public opinion, especially in the United States. Lisbon abandoned its previous laissez-faire approach to Portuguese Canadian media and took measures to control it. That meant creating community newspapers that could counter the Montreal-based Luso Canadiano, the first Portuguese newspaper founded in Canada, and the main anti-Salazar outlet in that country, which was also widely circulated in the opposition's international circuits. The Luso Canadiano was founded by Tavares Bello as the official organ of the APC. When he left that organization, Bello took the newspaper with him and associated with the MDP, which he founded in 1961. At this point, the Portuguese embassy helped launch a rival newspaper in Montreal, the Voice Portugal, which still exists today, whose main objective was to disseminate the dictatorship's message in the Portuguese community and counter the Luso Canadiano, including with rumors and libel for which the Voice Portugal's rector would later be found guilty in court. Fear of, into, of infiltration by PIV and its informants was prevalent and played a critical role in ensuring that most Portuguese immigrants remained politically passive. While mostly based on rumors, 
fear of political surveillance in Canada was justified. It was common for PID to act on intelligence received from diplomats, civilian informers, and Canadian intelligence services, which sometimes led to arrests of political immigrants returning home. For instance, the 29-year-old immigrant Eurik Nunes, a communist militant, was arrested in July 1970 when crossing the border into northern Portugal. In Canada, he was an executive member of the PCDA, a leading student activist at Ryerson College in Toronto, a translator at the Toronto airport, and a freelance journalist for the Luso Canadien and CBC Radio. Despite having no legal obligation to intervene, given that Nunes was not a Canadian citizen, Canadian diplomats agreed that they had a moral obligation to seek his release, since his arrest resulted from legal activities done in Canada. During his time in prison, Nunes was subjected to Pete's infamous torture techniques, uh, what one Canadian officer considered low-key interrogation. He was let go four days after his arrest and allowed to return to Canada thanks to the appeals to high-ranking government officials made by his American wife. When he returned to Toronto, Nunes told Canadian officials that several landed immigrants visiting Portugal had been arrested and released on condition that they become PED informants in Canada. Canadian officials deported many undocumented Portuguese migrants escaping military draft. The PCDA and NDP interceded on behalf of war resistors and exiles seeking political assign asylum and warned them about the violent reprisals these men would face if repatriated. In Montreal, the Portuguese consul turned to the Vos newspaper and the mainstream uh, uh, francophone newspaper La Presse to characterize the NDP as a, uh, agitators and the asylum seekers they helped as bogus refugees. Working with information provided by the, the consul, Canadian authorities raided Montreal's Portuguese community in 1961 in search of undocumented migrants. The MDP wrote a letter to the Federal Minister of Immigration protesting the arrest of one of its members and the constant threats and insults hurled at them by the Vos and the Portuguese consul, whom they tried to declare, whom they tried to have declared persona non grata. Portuguese diplomats in North America made multiple efforts at uniting the many fragmented community associations and clubs under large umbrella organizations and presenting this immigrant group as a cohesive constituency in the eyes of Canadian institutions and politicians who increasingly welcomed these spokesperson organizations since it suited their top-down approach to communicating with ethnic groups in the emerging multicultural polity. The first such organization was the Portuguese Canadian Congress, founded in Toronto in September 1969. Curiously, the initiative to form the Congress came from the community's left wing, following the high-profile mur murder of a young Portuguese immigrant by a Toronto police detective and a subsequent demonstration protesting police violence against immigrants. Its founding president, Domingos Costa Gomes, who was a known militant in the Portuguese Communist Party who had fled persecution in Portugal and, and uh, was also a leading member of the PCDA and NDP. Nonetheless, the Portuguese consul endorsed this organization and hosted its inaugural meeting, which was attended by the conservative faction led by Father Cunha. However, peace between the two sides only lasted three months until the conservatives splintered from the Congress and created their own short-lived federation. In the late 1960s, Portuguese diplomats also started seeing Portugal Day as an opportunity to unite all immigrants around their shared cultural heritage and work towards that elusive political unity. The first large Portugal Day celebration was organized in 1966 by then recently arrived Father Cunha. The following year, coincided, coinciding with Canada's centennial commemorations and the 50th anniversary of Fatima apparitions, Cunha arranged another momentous celebration that included a large parade in Toronto's downtown and an open air mass where about 10,000 people were said to be in attendance. In 1968, the Ontario government recognized Cunha's efforts by officially proclaiming the week of June 10 as Portuguese Week. The following year, the mayor of Toronto invited the Portuguese Canadian Congress to organize the city's Portugal Day festivities. By then, the Congress was led by Fernando Costa, an organizer for the governing Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Costa tried to include the consul and, F and Father Cunha in the festivities program, but did it in an undemocratic and secretive manner so to avoid being voted down by the leftist majority in the Congress executive. Internal conflict ensued once Costa's plans were revealed, which eventually led to the organization's implosion. Meanwhile, 
Father Cunha and his allies moved ahead with their own program as they had done in previous years. Uh, this time, however, the PCDA was not ready to see yet another official endorsement of the Stade Novo go unchallenged and held the demonstration during the flag raising event at City Hall while the consul performed his ceremonial duties. Portuguese diplomats followed the development of Canadian multiculturalism with interest, carefully considering how it could help them nurture the immigrants' ties to their homeland. They particularly appreciated the folklorist type of multiculturalism of the 60s and 70s, since it fit with the Stade Novo's propagandistic uses of folk culture. Nurturing the immigrants' cultural connections with the homeland and celebrating their quaint ethnicity brought economic benefits to the Portuguese government, since it promoted a vision of Portugal that corresponded with the regime's tourism marketing and cultural exports. In 1962, after seeing a performance by a Rancho Folklorico in Montreal, the local consul reported to Lisbon that the group had made a good impression, despite not having authentic Rancho garments or a knowledgeable choreographer. You noted that there was great enthusiasm among the Quebecois for folkloric activities, and that Canada was foregoing cultural assimilation for a pluralist policy that encouraged the preservation of ethno-cultural differences of the various immigrant groups. Considering this, he saw an urgent need for Lisbon to provide aid to these ranchos so that they could better represent Portuguese traditions. In this case, a tradition largely invented by the Estado Novo's propaganda to disseminate its conservative ruralist values and market Portuguese tourism. In 1964, Toronto's Rancho de Nazaré, the first rancho uh, founded in North America, won first prize in a local festival showcasing folk dances from around the world. In attendance was Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, who presented the victors with the award. The local council was impressed with the size of the event, which included 40 representations from the city's largest ethnic groups. He also noted that the Portuguese rancho had received no subsidy from Lisbon, unlike other national groups, which had been aided by their own homeland governments. The number of ranchos across Canada multiplied in the 60s, but despite the diplomats' repeated appeals, the Portuguese government failed to provide consistent aid to the immigrants' folk cultural initiatives. Although willing to advocate for the local ranchos, most diplomats held a deep-seated deep disdain for the immigrants' unsophisticated cultural expressions, stemming from their uncomfortable relation as members of Portugal's social elite with the peasant and working-class traditions of the immigrants they represented. Some diplomats expressed their displeasure with the fact that Portugal was commonly perceived in Canada as a backward country stuck in antiquated traditions and resented being associated with the unflattering rural imagery projected by their own government. For example, in 1958, the consul in Montreal complained to Lisbon about a Disney documentary screening, uh, a Disney documentary screening in that city that focused exclusively on Portugal's rural life. The scene that most irritated him showed the grape harvest in the Douro region, which culminated in the traditional pressing of the grapes by a dozen of barefoot men with their pants rolled up to their knees, stomping the fruit to the sound of an accordion. The consul was unaware whether this was still a common practice, which it was, and it still is in some parts, but knew that such spectacle was unpleasant. He added, and I quote, people will think twice before drinking another cup of port, of port wine. But the chief mission of the Estado Novo's foreign service and its diplomatic, uh, sorry, and its public diplomacy was to defend the empire in the face of growing anti-colonialist consensus at the international stage, in which Canada was one of the only NATO countries to speak openly against Salazar and the colonial wars. At every opportunity, when Portuguese diplomats were invited to give public speeches, references to Portugal's glorious seafaring past, its contributions to expanding Western Christian civilization, and the luso-tropicalist myths of a supposedly benign and racially harmonious empire were uttered. In Canada, this type of leveraging of Portugal's seafaring heritage for political gain was centered around the travels of the Courtreal family and their presumed discovery of Newfoundland and Labrador. The first efforts to celebrate the dubious legacy of the Courtreal brothers were made by Ambassador Eduard Brazel, an accomplished diplomat Brazil was an historian who published various works on the history of Portuguese maritime explorations, including The Portuguese Discoveries in the Histories of Canada, which was written during his tenure in Ottawa. In 1963, Brazil visited St. John's, Newfoundland, for his first official trip in Canada. 
The main purpose of this visit was to discuss international fishing jurisdiction over coastal waters, following Canada's intention to expand its territorial waters from, th from 3 to 12 miles, which would affect Portugal's rights to fish along its Atlantic coast. The Newfoundland government received Brazil with extraordinary honors, which included a reception at the St. John's House of Assembly during a parliamentary session, where he sat beside the House Speaker. This was the first time an ambassador was given such honor. At the St. John's Rotary Club uh, uh, later that day, after Brazil delivered a lecture about the supposed discovery of Canada by the Portuguese, the ambassador announced that his government had commissioned a pair of statues of the Courtreal brothers as a gift to the people of Newfoundland. Premier Joseph Smallwood promptly promised to place them in front of the new legislative building in St. John's, surround them with Portuguese soil, and proclaim an annual Portugal Day in the province. Smallwood's government made grandiose plans for the unveiling of the statue on September 8, 1965, and invited high-ranking Portuguese officials, including Salazar and two of his ministers. In preparation for this event, Brazil became frustrated with the apparent indifference of his foreign affairs ministry, which is often slow to respond to the Newfoundland government's inquiries regarding logistic details. Eventually, it was informed that the lack of enthusiasm in Lisbon resulted from the fact that Canada had recently increased its opposition to Portugal's colonial wars at the United Nations, which led high-ranking Estado, no uh, uh, high Estado Novo officials to decline Smallwood's invitation. Another reason for this loss of enthusiasm may have been the fact that the original goals of Brazil's diplomatic mission to St. John's had been accomplished by 1964, when Canada granted Portugal temporary exceptional privileges to fish within its territorial waters in recognition of the Portuguese historic rights. The statue of Courtreal uh, has been at the center of a recent controversy in Newfoundland, which may result in the statue being removed in the near future. I can talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. In the early 1970s, Portuguese communities in Canada became more autonomous from the Lisbon government and its diplomats. For instance, new sources of advertising, of advertising revenue became available to Portuguese ethnic media as Canadian governments began publishing more public announcements in the immigrants' native languages, the more community businesses sought to promote their products and services to their own co-ethnics through advertising. This reduced the, their dependency on Lisbon subsidies thus increasing their editorial freedom. While still publishing pre-approved content from the Stadunov's propaganda mills, the Portuguese Canadian press now focused more on local issues. By then, political factions were well-defined and its representatives made inroads with mainstream political parties. The PCDA and NDP moved farther to the left and began collaborating more, collaborating more closely with political exiles from other countries and Canadian leftist organizations that oppose Portugal's colonialism. Anti-colonial and pro-democratic protests outside of Portugal's foreign offices became a somewhat, somewhat, re, sorry, somewhat regular affair at this point. For instance, in 1973, the consulate in Toronto had its telephone line severed and received a bond threat, as did other Portuguese foreign offices in the United States. That decade, a new generation of progressive social workers, journalists, teachers, union organizers, and politicians emerged in Canada's Portuguese communities. Most had migrated at a young age or had only recently arrived in Canada. They were usually young, bilingual, better educated than their peers, and moved comfortably in mainstream and immigrant contexts. While they maintained deep connections with Portugal and followed its political developments with interest, these young progressives focused primarily on local matters rather than homeland politics. They founded social service agencies, newspapers, radio stations, and other organizations separate from the older conservative leaders and distanced themselves from the Estado Novo's diplomats, not only because they were opposed to the regime, but also because they were better prepared than their predecessors to find resources and political capital from Canadian governments and other sources in mainstream, mainstream civil society. This made the Portuguese diplomats nervous. For example, in Montreal, a group of young progressive Catholics founded the social service agency Centro Português de Referência e Promoção Social at the city's Portuguese parish, the Santa Cruz Mission, where these community organizers originally met. After securing poor funding from the federal government, the center moved out of the parish into their own location, which also uh, meant that they moved away from the supervision of Father Frederic Fatella, 
a leading conservative leader in Montreal's Portuguese community and supporter of the dictatorship. One of the center's founding committee mem members was the communist Rui Cunha Viena, who was then the president of the NDP and director of the Luso Canadiana. This convergence of older and newer progressive forces prompted the Portuguese ambassador to request that Lisbon elevate the Montreal consulate to a higher diplomatic class so that they could hire more staff to deal with the growing threat of a, uni of a united opposition. News of the Estado Novo's fall on April 25th, 1974, were initially greeted with hope and euphoria by most immigrants. But in the turbulent revolutionary transition period that followed, Portuguese expatriates grew apprehensive about their kin and property in the homeland as they watched tensions between opposing factions escalate into near civil war. The intense political atmosphere of the interim revolutionary period that lasted until April 1976 was felt in Toronto and Montreal, where there were multiple rallies, protests, fundraisers by pro and counter-revolutionaries, including the supporters of the Azorian Liberation Front and Antonio Spinola's so-called silent majority. Visits by interim government delegations, major political figures and revolutionary artists and, and singers were common during this period. One Portuguese delegation, which included the revolutionary leader Salgueiro Maia and then Secretary of Immigration Pedro Coelho, met with Canadian federal government officials to discuss, to discuss a new migration agreement that could ease the employment and housing crisis in Portugal, resulting from the return of former immigrants, demobilized soldiers and colonial settlers. The Canadians declined, alleging that the legislation did not allow for special immigration provisions for individual countries, which was not entirely true. These visits were very eye-opening for Portuguese officials. For instance, during his trip to Ottawa in June 1974, where he attended a NATO summit, the future Prime Minister Mari Suárez, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, had the opportunity to interact with Portuguese diplomats as a guest of honor at a community dinner attended by 500 people. Upon returning to Lisbon, he described this event to a national newspaper as one of the most instructive parts of his trip, since he was able to hear about the immigrants' experiences, problems, and expectations directly from their mouths. One of the demands he heard repeatedly is for his ministry to purge the Stadunov's diplomats in Canada and replace them with pro-revolutionary ones. This was, a top, this was a top priority for former political exiles. The Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese Democratic Action Congress of North America founded in Montreal in 1973, sent a delegation to Lisbon a few days after the revolution to meet with the provisional revolutionary junta and communicate their expectations, which included, quote, liberating the expatriate communities from, quote, fascist diplomats. The PCDA even planned to occupy the Toronto consulate should the interim revolutionary government fail to replace the previous consul. They also urged Lisbon to stop subsidizing or organizations run by the so-called fascist leaders. The most notorious of these was Father Alberto Cunha, who now spread anti-communist misinformation about the situation in Portugal through his own radio and TV shows. To counter his message, which connected primarily with the Azorian majority, the PCDA bought ad space in the Global Mail and published a statement of support for the MFA, MFA, which was signed by a long list of Portuguese immigrants and illustrious Canadian allies. This prompted a response from the right-wing faction, which organized a march in Toronto's Kensington Market, which is Canada's most densely populated Portuguese neighborhood, where about 200 demonstrators, uh, demonstrators chanted death to communists and threatened to set fire to the PCDA's office. The newly appointed consuls urged community members to seek information from reliable sources, such as the bulletin circulated by the consulates. Father Cunha's impact was such that when the interim prime minister in, interim Prime Minister Vasco Gonçalves met with Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau for the first time in June 1974, the first item raised by Gonçalves were the actions of the conservative priest, whose alleged criminal activities the Portuguese Prime Minister asked his counterpart to investigate. Trudeau must have found this especially troubling, considering that just a few weeks earlier, he had walked along, alongside Father Cunha during Toronto's Santo Cristo procession which drew about 90,000 people that year. The new diplomatic corps in Canada vowed never to subject their expatriate citizens to the same neglect that they had suffered under the dictatorship. According to the new consul in Toronto, Ernesto Feu, the dictatorship had regarded immigrants simply as a source of remittances. By contrast, 
He proposed to turn his office into a social service agency dedicated to integrating Portuguese uh, expats into Canadian society and sponsor an institute dedicated to solving the legal, educational, health, and employment problems. Portuguese immigrants now have the chance to address their demands directly to their state secretaries and members of parliament in Lisbon, who are more receptive than the Estado Novo's officials. But while post-revolutionary governments like to contrast their progressive diasporic commitments against the dictatorship's neglect and unreliability, they eventually pointed to a familiar constraint. There's little money. Remittances grew to record, sorry, remittances grew to record heights after 1975, despite the sharp drop in immigration. Besides cementing relations between the diaspora and the homeland, this increase bolstered the immigrants' leverage when making demands of the Lisbon government, which was happy to offer them incentives to invest or deposit their savings in Portugal. Asked by a leftist Portuguese Canadian newspaper if the Portuguese government was continuing a Salazar Caetano type of policy, where immigration was effectively stimulated for the sake of boosting remittances, the State Secretary of Immigration, João Lima, answered categorically that he was not, yet acknowledged that, quote, at first glance, both policies might appear to be similar, end quote. Portugal Day parades and surrounding festivities also grew in size after the revolution and were attended by a greater number of Canadian dignitaries, including prime ministers and premiers. An estimated 80,000 people attended the 1977 festivities in Toronto, where they enjoyed performances from homeland and local Portuguese artists, including uh, amateur Fado singers like Consul Ernesto Fio. The next year, Portugal Day celebrations were dedicated to commemorating the 25th anniversary of Portuguese mass migration to Canada. In Toronto's High Park, ethnic leaders erected a monument to their community in the form of a padrão, alluding to Portugal's imperial history. The unveiling encounter with the presence of Portuguese diplomats, Canadian politicians, and the MFA captain, Vitor Alves, who had shared Portugal's national holiday celebrations the year prior. As in the past, Canadian officials at these events extolled the imperial heritage of the Portuguese, of Portuguese Canadians and traced direct links between the seafaring explorers and the immigrants who made good citizens anywhere they settled. Whereas Portuguese officials continued to urge their expatriate citizens to unite and flex their political muscle. In conclusion, as representatives of one of the last right-wing European dictatorships and colonial empires after the Second World War, with its antiquated, impoverished, terribly underdeveloped, violently repressive, and stifling authoritarian government that was allowed to exist by the liberal democratic Western nations because of its anti-communism during the Cold War, Portuguese diplomats in the post-war post period were tasked with an enormous mission to defend the regime and its centuries-old colonial empire against a growing consensus at the international stage across all three blocs, the West, the Soviet Union, and the so-called Third World, about the need to dismantle the Portuguese Empire. How does a small peripheral government with few material resources assert itself as a significant geopolitical force in an era of rising global governance when rival superpowers threaten the sovereignty of nation-states and colonial empires? For Salazar, the answer was to reinvent Portugal's imperial regime as a Western stronghold against international communism and an exceptional multiracial haven whose contributions to Christian civilization were at the genesis of Western global dominance. When this imperial fantasy began to crumble in the face of the anti-colonialist winds of history, the regime's propaganda continued to push its lusotropicalist fiction while drafting the nation's youth to kill and die in unfamiliar overseas provinces, as they were called at the time. Meanwhile, a parallel offspring version of pluricontinental nationhood gained traction in those ministries engaged in foreign affairs, one that envisioned the unification of all Portuguese expa expatriates and descendants under one large diaspora loyal to the homeland. Eventually, the Estado Novo's sovereignty by force strategy led to its own demise, along with the empire that legitimized Portugal's claim to being a large country. Hovering above its debris remained the deterritorialized version of nation, where being Portuguese meant sharing in a national heritage that celebrated itinerancy and hybridity. The dictatorship's diplomats were the first to see the political and economic potential of articulating the somewhat loose collective of Portuguese transnational communities into one diaspora with its own networks, institutions, resources, 
which the Lisbon government might be able to leverage to advance its foreign interests. However, the revision of diaspora, you know, if uh, they did not use that term exactly in the 70s, their vision of diaspora was not shared by Salazar and other in, uh, internal minded sectors of the Estado Novo, though uh, that was beginning to change under Marcel Caetan. The Estado Novo's diplomats recruited, manipulated, and sometimes coerced immigrant leaders and their institutions to do the homeland government's bidding in direct contravention of non interventionist diplomatic conventions. At the same time, diplomats were not mere ex uh, executors of the Estado Novo's foreign policy. In fact, much of their organizational efforts had little resonance in Lisbon and were inhibited by their superiors' lack of support or vision, especially before the mid-60s. Some diplomats were genuinely some diplomats were genuinely dedicated to the communities they served, undertook tasks that went beyond their expected duties, and took matters into their own hands when they failed to obtain a timely or satisfactory response from Lisbon. Most diplomats admire the immigrants' efforts to preserve their cultural and linguistic heritage and occasionally rebuke their own government for not reciprocating. They also recognize the political and economic advantage provided by the type of proto-multiculturalism emerging in Canada, which focused on the performative and consumable aspects of the immigrants' national cultures. This was fertile, fertile ground for the Estado Novo's propaganda and for the diplomats' efforts to unite and leverage the immigrant communities, nurture their national identity, and increase tourism and trade. But despite delivering the Estado Novo's ruralist propaganda, diplomats were embarrassed by the peasant character of ethnic performances and found it at times inappropriate for modern North American audiences. They also tended to have a more liberal worldview than their internal peers in the Portuguese government, given their cosmopolitan education and prolonged residence in modern liberal democratic nations going through tremendous economic development, as was the case in Canada. Still, they carried out their missions with a great deal of cognitive dissonance since they stimulated the immigrant communities, since they stimulated in the immigrant communities, the very civic and political engagement that the dictatorship curbed at home. After 1974, the new democratic government marked its difference from its predecessor by highlighting the negligence that immigrant communities had been subjected to during the Estado Novo, but also went on building and celebrating the Portuguese diaspora on the foundations laid by the foreign service of the imperial regime using many of the same tired old references to seafaring heritage. While warranted, criticism of the dictatorship's engagement with the immigrant communities at this point was overly simplistic and it sometimes backfired, especially when democratic government officials were seen to deploy the same language and methods uh, as their predecessors. But while the post-1974 diplomats had a clearer vision better institutional tools and democratic legitimacy with which to serve the expatriate citizenry, they soon were confronted with the same lack of funds that plagued their predecessors and forced them to limit the scope of their actions in the first years after the revolution. Much has happened since then, much has changed, but our time today doesn't allow us to go much further. Thank you. Thank you, Professor for a very comprehensive, dense and interesting intervention. I now open the floor for questions. I, um, I, I would like you both either that you do the question yourself or that you put it in the chat. I see it in the chat. But I, before before I give the floor to others, I would like just to tell you that at the beginning of, of your PowerPoint, there are images of a visit of uh, um, President Yanush to um, Ottawa in 84, and he, him speaking with Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, at that time, I, I was posted in Washington, and one month before the visit, they sent me to reinforce the embassy. Uh, so I arrived there, I stayed there for, for two weeks. And on the day at the arrival of the president, there is a huge blizzard coming in towards Ottawa. And we have snow, knee deep, and, uh, and the flight had to be uh, sent, diverted to, to, to the Newfoundland. So we were there. Uh, 
very nervous, uh, thinking that the visit would be a flop, it, it was not going to happen. But finally, the, the weather opened and the plane came. And I do recall that the, the ceremony, the arrival ceremony, was inside a huge hangar uh, on the outskirts of, um, of Ottawa. Uh, then the second point I would like to make very, very uh, uh, quickly in order to, to, to ask you something is that uh, my mother told me uh, that m my grandfather that also wrote and he, he, in my historical research that he was a very good friend of Eduardo Brazil. And I heard her telling me uh, about, about uh, the, the, the friendship uh, of my grandfather with Brazil and with other, 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 other intellectual, intellectuals. And I had the impression that Brazil was a liberal in the sense that, of course, he was a, a diplomat in following the, 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 what the, the policies of the government and defending the, the the country in that way, but th that he was not a, a, a follower of the Salazar regime. Of, uh, that, that, are you aware of that or not? And the other, the other question is, uh, tell us about the polemics regarding the, the Court Real brothers. Thank you for that question Thank and you. for that um, um, uh, vignette uh, uh, memory of what uh, happened during the, the visit of President Hamal Yens to Canada. I'll take the opportunity of answers of, uh, of the audience um, to say that uh, it would be wonderful to do a, an oral history uh, with the various uh, diplomats that have served in Canada over the years. Uh, my research uh, thus far is only extended to the few years after the revolution, and obviously much has happened since, and it's, it, uh, it continues to be a very rich and, and very interesting uh, history. And so those tidbits of information, those memories, um, which uh, don't really, um, rarely we come across um, uh, in the archives, in the written, uh, in the traditional uh, form, uh, those would be, you know, only an oral history can really flesh that out. Um, which I'll segue to answering your question about Eduardo Brazil, whether I was aware of his um, um, liberal uh, uh, point of view, worldview. Uh, I don't know. I didn't know specifically about Eduardo Brazil. Uh, again, the um, the archives that uh, I've consulted, these are the archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and, and many others, but uh, as far as uh, the communications from the diplomats. And of course, in those communications, that sort of information would not be uh, expressed, obviously, sure. under, while yeah. serving Sadnov. Hence why um, research, uh, oral history research, uh, is able to reveal uh, important pieces of information that are not uh, always present on the written record. So I didn't know about Brazil specifically, although it was, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my uh, presentation, and I mentioned more extensively in the book, uh, generally speaking, of course, not all, but many of the ambassadors and consuls were, relatively speaking, more liberal than mm -hmm. their internal uh, government uh, peers. Um, and, and this is a result of their education, the result of the fact that they lived, uh, worked for most of their careers mm -hmm. in, in uh, liberal democratic nations and saw the benefits of, uh, of, of, of that entail politically and economically. Uh, and that uh, came across in their communications and, and in their frustration, but never, never, of course, uh, outright, uh, because like I said, the communications that I had uh, access to are their official communications. But it, it is uh, certainly um, something that does uh, come, come across. Um, as far as the Court Real statue, um, I mean, this is a, we can do a whole presentation about this, and surely there are others uh, here that could speak uh, to its details uh, in an ongoing, uh, uh, you know, issue better than me. But um, a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, um, during what we call the Black Lives, the summer of Black Lives Matter, uh, when there's uh, a growing discussion about 
um, the place of uh, colonialist uh, heroes, uh, quote unquote heroes, um, in public space, uh, statuary, and other monuments, um, and how there's, for instance, John M. Macdonald, the first prime minister of Canada, uh, is very much one of the, the historical figures uh, that have been under a greater scrutiny. Um, during that discussion, in which many of these statues were uh, toppled, uh, there was discussion about, there has been discussion about the legacy of Court Real and the, the, the memory work that that statue is supposed to be doing. And so uh, there isn't much documentation to support the presence of, of, of uh, the Cortial brothers in Newfoundland. Uh, I'm not an uh, 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 early modern historian, but, but I know a little bit about uh, the fact that uh, the only uh, known documents uh, suggesting that the Cortials uh, did step foot in Newfoundland was uh, a few letters exchanged by the, the ambassador, or consul, whatever the title was at the time, of Venice in Lisbon and his aide, uh, something to the extent of uh, the Cortrials had just arrived and apparently they have, have visited this new Terra Nova and brought with them 50, I uh, can't remember now, 50 odd um, indigenous uh, peoples, by, which is uh, one could uh, understand enslaved, uh, brought by force. And so, the focus now um, of the protesting uh, of the presence of that statue is in that specific part of the story, okay. that Cortrial was a slaver uh, in that he um, brought uh, uh, these uh, 50 uh, odd indigenous persons, which would have been Beothuks, which are now essentially an extinct First Nation. Okay. Um, I uh, wasn't. Uh, I've done some some research about this. I haven't published it yet because I have to still go to archives in, uh, of uh, the, uh, Newfoundland uh, to do more research there. But it's a fascinating topic, and I give an interview to the CBC about it, where I talked about the history of the statue itself and the political leveraging uh, that was uh, behind it. Um, and since then, uh, I've been also approached by uh, the the Newfoundland government uh, to talk more about this. And so I don't know what the current, uh, if the government of Newfoundland has reached a decision about the future of the statue, uh, but it's possible uh, that it may be removed, uh, whether or not it will be placed in a museum or some kind of museological space, which would be my, my personal preference. Uh, that part, uh, I don't know, but there is an ongoing discussion about, about this legacy. Thank you so much. Can you see the, the chat on the right? I can, and I can address that question. Please. Uh, so uh, this uh, Francisco Antonio, uh, unfortunately I can't see your last name. Oliveira. Oliveira, uh, thank you for your, your question um, and for your kind words. Um, Francisco asks, uh, how did the political activity of Portuguese community in Canada, mainly in the 60s and 70s, differ from that of other significant communities of expatriated Portuguese? Um, well, of course, the political uh, participation, engagement of uh, Portuguese Canadians uh, or Portuguese immigrants in general er, er, is heavily predicated by their context, uh, uh, the societies in which uh, these things happen. Um, the, the most obvious comparison would be with the United States. Um, and I can say that the, as far as the opposition to Salazar and to the Shad Nov in general, there was much greater activity in Canada. Um, there were uh, the groups that were organized were they were better organized or more vocal. They were also much more leftist. Uh, and by the uh, early and mid sixties, they become they go from uh, a liberal democratic, social democratic to communist. Um, and that um, Canada was not uh, um, friendly towards communists by any stretch. But some uh, exiles in their communication, their letters, did perceive Canada to be fairly more amenable to um, engaging in their free speech as far as uh, their communist uh, ideology uh, in comparison to the United States. Um, that might be purely perception because in reality, uh, the RCMP and other Canadian uh, intelligence services did spy on them, did share information with, the, with P. Uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but there was definitely a much greater activity 
uh, as far as uh, political activism. Also because, um, I mean, the, the leading group um, anti-Salazar organization in the United States was the Committee, Committee Pro-Democracy, um, which is based in the greater New York area. And that was, was uh, led by, uh, his name now escapes me, uh, Bilio uh, Aguas, uh, Silva Aguas, I don't remember now, who was a diehard anti-communist Democrat, um, liberal Democrat, so of the, 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 from the Republican, uh, the earlier Republican opposition uh, to the uh, regime. Uh, now, those first Republican political exiles um, were uh, quite vocal and, and um, impactful uh, and concerning for Portuguese authorities uh, in the United States. The, 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 these quite a few foreign ministries, Ron uh there was a progressive priest as well. There's quite a few of these Republican voices, which are primarily liberal democratic. Um, because Portuguese immigration, mass immigration to the United States doesn't really pick up again until 1965, well, in Canada it starts in 1953, um, this new wave of Portuguese uh, uh, political exiles starts later. So it's only later that there are more uh, political voices farther to the left uh, in the United States, uh, while in Canada those start um, earlier. Um, because it's a more recent community, while the United States, these communities go back to the 19th century and their politics are primarily, well, certainly informed and pay attention to what's happening in Portugal, but are primarily geared towards U.S. politics and local politics. Um, in, the, in Canada, there are more recent communities, so for the first generation, uh, the politics that happen are primarily concerned with what's happening uh, in Portugal. Uh, I would say quickly also, for instance, comparison to France, um, because of the French political context, because of its proximity to Portugal, the geographic proximity, uh, because of the ability of uh, communists, and not only communists, but other left-wing uh, uh, political opponents of the regime, their ability to uh, uh, go uh, to, to you know, uh, pass the borders, uh, and uh, visit, uh, visit France uh, along with other countries, um, there's a much greater ability and presence of a, uh, a communist opposition uh, in France, which is much larger, obviously also because the Portuguese community in France is, is much, much larger. I don't know today, but Paris, I often say that Paris is the third largest si uh, Portuguese city in the world, as far as Portuguese cities, uh, residents go. Um, and so in that, in that context, um, there were uh, uh, leftist politics in, in the community, which much, were much more present. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. There is another question. That one in Portuguese from Joaquim Graz de Matos. Uh, Tudo bem? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Just with, with the wave of the Portuguese after the war and the fact that this big wave nowadays we have a much smaller immigration going to Canada and uh, and then the question okay. regarding the changing of the, the situation less mm -hmm. immigrants Portanto, eu vou, vou responder em português, à pergunta okay. colocada em português. Um, os, números, uh, os números oficiais de imigração portuguesa, uh, salvo erro como, como, como refere, uh, rondam os 800, uh, 800 e tal por ano. Mas uh, sabemos, uh, uh, anecdotally, uh, já não me lembro como se diz em português, um, uh, informalmente, uh, qualquer pessoa que vive, por exemplo, em Toronto, especialmente em Toronto, mas uh, provavelmente também em Montreal, Conhece vários casos de imigrantes indocumentados. Uh, muitos deles uh, trabalham na construção, na indústria de construção, que se, uh, a indústria de construção uh, tem perenialmente um, um, é uma necessidade muito grande de trabalhadores, de operários manuais e de uh, 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 tradesmen. Um, 
e, portanto, muitos desses imigrantes são, arranjam um trabalho aqui e, e, e conseguem viver aqui uma vida relativamente razoável, economicamente. Uh, portanto, os números serão maiores. Uh, e é realmente impressionante visitar, uh, portanto, até o Covid, uh, a parada do Dia de Portugal em Toronto, todos os anos, aumentava. Uh, e, portanto, são números absolutamente impressionantes. Uh, certos anos, já cerca de 200 mil pessoas a participar na parada. Um, utilizando o exemplo dos Estados Unidos, por exemplo, a ideia de que um, as comunidades imigrantes acabaram por se assimilar, geração após geração, e que há um movimento uh, linear nesse, nesse sentido, uh, não, não, é, não é necessário, uh, necessariamente assim que acontece. E há muitos, muitos exemplos, muitos casos, isso é uma, uma, um ponto de vista sociológico já um bocado ultrapassado, essa, essa teoria da assimila assimilação uh, uh, após várias gerações. Um, um, uh, uh, o, o reclamar, digamos, da identidade cultural portuguesa, da herança portuguesa e da cidadania portuguesa é algo que está, obviamente, muito ligado à, à quantidade, ao volume de imigração, Uh, que permite, então, uh, portanto, reinvigorar, revitalizar uh, 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 as várias organizações, mas não é só uh, uh, por causa disso. Portanto, por exemplo, a posição de Portugal no mundo, uh, 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 portanto, o estatuto que Portugal tem no mundo, portanto, há aqui há alguns anos atrás, dois ou três anos atrás, a revista Monocle uh, colocou Portugal como o décimo, nono ou décimo país com maior soft power. Uh, uh, no mundo. Uh, portanto, um, uh, a popularidade que Portugal tem, o seu turismo, uh, os seus produtos, um, as conquistas da seleção nacional, o Cristiano Ronaldo, sem dúvida alguma, uh, projeta uma, ideia, uma, uma imagem de competência, de talento, de flair, uh, ao qual os descendentes portugueses podem apontar o dedo com, com, com orgulho um, e a comunidade, comunidades uh, canadiana, neste caso, tem uh, referências do que é Portugal. Uh, tudo isso ajuda um, a que uh, gerações posteriores uh, mantenham interesse em Portugal. Para além disso, a internet, os voos relativamente mais baratos do que no passado, um, uh, várias políticas, uh, do meu ponto de vista progressistas, da, do Estado português, Uh, relacionados com a cidadania, uh, a liberalização uh, políticas liberais e democráticas de cidadania, os vistos, por exemplo, do digital nomad, etc. Tudo isso, uh, depois, claro, a sociedade pacífica, amigável, progressista, tecnicamente, com, com tecnologia avançada, especialmente nas cidades, tudo isso atrai, não só, tudo tem estado a atrair pessoas de todo o mundo, especialmente jovens, e, obviamente, os jovens portugueses, os luso-canadianos, tem esse, esse capital cultural, muitos deles falam português, ou algum português, suficiente pelo menos para depois restabelecer. Um, tudo isso permite, uh, um, uh, portanto, um, um, uma, um, um, um renascer, vá, um revitalizar das identidades e, e, e uh, identificação com, com a portugalidade entre as várias gerações uh, de portugueses. Portanto, a questão da imigração é importante, mas não é tudo. Uh, should I uh, read the next one by Pedro Miguel Duarte? So, uh, Pedro Miguel Duarte asks, what would be, very briefly, the main differences between our immigration waves from the 1960s to the current ones? Um, well, the main ones, of course, uh, is a very different time. Um, Portugal was uh, under a dictatorship, of course. Colonial wars were ongoing. That was a major factor pro uh, pushing Portuguese immigrants to leave. Um, Canadian economy was in uh, great uh, uh, expansion. Uh, the economic boom in the Great Toronto area and Montreal and, and other places, uh, which actually had a lot of pull factors economically. Um, for more immigrants to come, <clears throat> including uh, including uh, undocumented migrants. Many of them would, uh, even those who were, were deported, many of them would return or were granted 
were granted amnesty uh, by, for instance, Trudeau uh, and others. Um, and of course, Portugal is a very, very different place. Um, the push factors were much different, economically speaking, uh, while certainly there's hardship uh, in some uh, places in Portugal and some sectors of society, uh, it was definitely even more so during the austerity years uh, where we saw uh, another peak in immigration, uh, a peak similar uh, as far as numbers goes to the immigration we saw in the 60s. But uh, compared to the miserable, uh, the miserable um, economic uh, prospects facing Portuguese immigrants in, in the 60s, especially in the Azores, uh, were much, much greater. Of course, there was no welfare state and no, no other um, uh, uh, government support, um, along with the lack of industry, education, and so on and so forth. Uh, today, um, I mean, my study, my research has focused primarily, as a historian, has focused primarily on, on this post-war period. So I have, I have not done extensive research about current uh, recent immigration. Uh, I am an immigrant myself. I've been in Canada for 17 years now. So I, I am both Portuguese and Canadian citizen. Um, but uh, so I, from, from my knowledge, my anecdotal knowledge, but also just from, from reading and keeping abreast of, of this topic, um, there are still a significant number of, uh, of migrant uh, workers, um, skilled and, and unskilled, and those would be uh, surely the, the majority. But there's a greater number of highly qualified, um, you know, educated uh, Portuguese immigrants, professionals, um, who um, have now arriving, when they arrive in Canada, they have now a, a wide range of uh, support uh, from the Canadian mainstream society, but also from Portuguese, the very, uh, very uh, strong and, and, and uh, full of vitality uh, Portuguese communities. Uh, it, it, it is, it, it, it dumbfounds me actually, it's amazing to me, for instance, the amount of uh, news outlets uh, in Portuguese uh, Canadian, uh, you know, communities in Toronto, Montreal, just a number of newspapers and magazines, the radio stations, TV shows, it's really amazing. So uh, and there's other institutions of support. There's various individuals in positions of, of influence with various kinds of capital, uh, which um, are able to, uh, to help uh, and make resources available to, to these newcomers. So we have a lot, the last question that in a sense you already, you already focused, I think you did mention. It's from Beatriz Marquilhas, and uh... yes. Uh, so uh, I'll repeat her. Uh, I'll read out her question. Much, much is often said about the fact that the Portuguese communities in the diaspora tend to maintain strong and lasting, uh, lasting, effective bonds with their country. From your perspective, is there a historical reason explaining this? Um, it's, it's hard to say universally because, like I said, every community exists with its own context. And the context of the diaspora communities are not just the, the host nations, but also whatever's happening in the homeland, whatever's happening in the world. Yeah. And so whatever's happening in the homeland is the one constant uh, factor across these various communities. Uh, of course, there's many similarities in, uh, in Portuguese communities in, in Canada or the United States or, or other countries. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, I think, well, there, there's major reasons. Um, there is, the Portuguese diaspora is not simply, and I hope I didn't get uh, uh, past this idea, Portuguese diaspora is not simply a product of the Portuguese government. It's not that the Portuguese government invented diaspora. Um, it, set, it certainly did play a very important role in articulating it, creating its institutions uh, and be, be in providing a, a nexus uh, and, and various resources. Mm -hmm. And so this, even though uh, this has been commemorated and celebrated and really um, become official policy after 1974, there was already, and what my research talks about, there was already a, 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 a proto-diasporic policy, if you will, uh, you know, the budding diasporic uh, networks and, and consciousness happening during the Stade de Neuf, which, which came with that uh, imperial um, mandate. And I 
I think the fact that, uh, well, not unique, um, I, would, I would say that uh, uh, among immigrant nations, uh, Portugal is one of the, uh, mm -hmm. the first nations to develop these diasporic building policies. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the, first, the second country after France to uh, create a Conselho das Comunidades, Council of Communities. Uh, one of the first, not not the first, but one of the first uh, uh, handful of countries or a dozen countries or so to extend external vote to to its expatri expatriated citizens. So there's all manner of resources, political and economic, um, that encourage uh, this connection. Um, and also, there's so there's a political, but there's also the cultural. There's the narrative of Portuguese identity what it means to be Portuguese. And um, while, uh, while I am personally, uh, what's what I'm looking for, critical of the continued mm -hmm. usage of imperial heritage to install the virtues of Portuguese immigrants today, because it's highly problematic considering, well, obviously the colonialist uh, history of, of our mm -hmm. country. Um, it is, that is definitely part of our history and has been part of our cultural DNA this idea of the narrative of travel, the narrative of self-discovery elsewhere, the idea that uh, as uh, one American consul and one Portuguese consul in the US said, a Portuguese who's only a Portuguese is not a Portuguese. And it's really amazing, uh, for instance, in this uh, exhibition that I'm currently curating, and I've been interviewing a lot of uh, recent Portuguese uh, uh, immigrants, uh, how this is common and this is prevalent across uh, many uh, Portuguese diasporic individuals who say, you know, I really became Portuguese when I left Portugal. I really discovered what my country is all about after I left it. Um, so there is on a cultural level, uh, both in terms of literature, both in art and in, in so many ways, the narrative of it's okay to be Portuguese and something else, and not only is it okay, it is desirable, it becomes, it lends itself to a much more inclusive citizenship. Uh, perception of citizenship. So so that's one. So it's, it's perhaps less exclusivist citizenship and sense of nationhood than other nations that don't have that imperial history. Um, but then, of course, the, the, the continuous and, and currently what I think a real uh, renaissance of Portuguese culture uh, in the diaspora, it's reflecting the renaissance of Portuguese culture in Portugal. Uh, I left Portugal in 2004. Uh, I was born in 79, so I'm part of the first generation to be born and raised in, in a democracy. And I absolutely uh, owe uh, where I am today to the revolution. My parents, uh, my mother's fourth grade, uh, they were peasants. There was no way I would have uh, pursued uh, higher education if not for the revolution. And, uh, but in the 90s, I remember there wasn't, it wasn't cool to listen to Portuguese music. We all wanted American culture and so on. Today is a very different story. Um, and so the cultural production that happens in Portugal is, is incredibly rich. It's incredibly inclusive. It's cosmopolitan, especially in the cities. Um, and uh, with, again, with tourism, with, with, with trade, uh, with investment that is happening um, in Portugal, um, all of this makes Portugal very attractive in the eyes of the world. Um, these, uh, the, I mean, uh, to, to, to uh, arguable, but, but certainly a, the success story uh, uh, after the austerity, uh, all of these things, uh, the fact that it's a friendly nation, the fact that it's progressive, uh, all of these things certainly make uh, Portuguese uh, immigrants and descendants uh, more proud about their heritage and more willing to assert uh, uh, and, and claim their, their identity than in previous, uh, in previous years and in previous uh, generations. So, Professor, thank you so much. Uh, I would like also to thank our Portuguese ambassador to Canada, uh, Antonio Leon Rocha. Oh, he's there, he's still there. And, uh, and of course, our Canadian friend here at uh, the, at the, uh, the Canadian Embassy in Lisbon. So, thank you so much. We will be in touch if you want regarding the oral history. You can get 
back to us and that I can because the oral history uh, is made at the, the Instituto Diplomatic also and uh, the archives are part of the DD, the Diplomatic Institute. So thank you once again and from Lisbon, good afternoon, goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you again for the invitation, for everyone that attended for the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.